if you look at interest on the debt, and don't don't bother looking at net interest, which is a category that the Treasury Department puts in in their monthly statement. You know, net interest plays a lot of accounting games to hide the true amount of interest that's being paid on the debt, which is called gross interest. So look at that one; it's already at an annualized rate of a trillion dollars. In other words, it's going to cost a trillion dollars just to service the debt. Again, not pay it down, just to service the debt, just an interest. Yes, it is bigger than our defense spending all, already. Um, a lot of people think, oh, no, it's not that big yet. Again, because they're looking at that net interest component and not the broader gross interest component. Um, so what's the government going to do? They're going to counterfeit. But we can just call that quantitative easing because I guess it sounds nicer when, when the Federal Reserve says that instead of, hey, we're counterfeiting money and siphoning off value from every dollar that exists in order to create new ones. Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I have the pleasure and honor of being here with a fantastic economist, truth in economics, I call it, Dr. E.J. Antony. He is a research fellow at Heritage Foundation, public finance economist, focusing on fiscal and monetary policies. And we are going to go beyond the headlines today. I love your Twitter Quote, well, it says, I may be wrong, but it's highly unlikely. And I agree completely as you are my favorite, one of my favorite economists. How are you doing today, EJ? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. It really is a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here today. So I want to start with your background because, you know, it's um, the mainstream economists have one story and you are this beautiful select group of special economists that talk about truth, freedom, and prosperity for all. So how did you come to the real economics? Oh, goodness, that's a wonderful question. Um, yeah, I, I guess it was just the fact that um, I, I'm, I suppose I'm more in the mold of, of uh, a William F. Buckley, you know Thomas Sowell, who's actually one of my heroes. He he went through a, a whole phase in his in his life where he was actually a Marxist. You know uh, Milton Friedman, I believe, uh, was a Keynesian at one point, right? F. A. Mm -hmm. Hayek was a socialist. Uh, so a lot of people, I would say, the vast majority of them, you know, start out leaning left and eventually realize, oh my goodness, none of this stuff actually works, and then they begin to question, well, what what does work? And so I, I think I was just very blessed in, in that I, I had a very conservative upbringing. And, and at some point I, I stopped and I had to ask myself, you know, why do I actually believe any of these things? Is it, is it because they're, they're actually true or is it simply just I believe what I'm taught and, and that's the end of it? So I suppose I, I did go through a bit of a phase where, where I really uh, did more investigation, if you will, uh, into the data, into the theories and seeing do the things that I say actually match the observable world that I see? And every time I, I asked those questions, the answer to that was yes. And that's not to you know, pat myself on the back and say, oh, see, I was right all along, because very few of my ideas are original. Very few of them are actually my own. Uh, you know, To borrow a, a phrase, we, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And I, I think I was very blessed um, in that I, I found myself on the shoulders of those giants very early on and did frankly did not have to do much climbing to get there. Love that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. You know, it's it's a blessing that you are doing what you're doing because we need more economists like you to enlighten people because the headlines are very deceiving and they do support their narratives. So today I'd like to go under the hood as you always seem to do. And, you know, we can't trust these good headlines and how they collect and calculate the data. So <clears throat> I love to start with your excellent articles that you write on the Heritage Foundation site. And we're gonna start with Bidenomics. You wrote, America is hurting, but it's not for the lack of money. The state escape, which obviously we know has to be New York, <laughs> and Bidenomics defined. Could you please tell us about this concept of Bidenomics and how people are certainly not better off four years now than we were four years ago? 
You know, certainly. I mean, what what is Bidenomics, right? That's, that's a question a lot of a lot of people have asked. It's a question I guess the Wall Street Journal was was probably the first ones to try to answer. I, I think the best way you can sum up Bidenomics is that it is the government overspending, over borrowing, over printing, and let's throw in over regulating in there uh, as well. And and what has the result been? It's been largely the impoverishment of most Americans. Now, you know, are are things like in aggregate, consumer spending numbers up. Absolutely, there's no denying that. But who is doing all of that spending? You know, you have this incredible disparity in terms of the economic recovery under Biden, where the vast majority of Americans have essentially been left behind. They they first depleted all of their pandemic era savings, then they depleted uh, the savings they had before the pandemic, and then after that, they had no choice but to go into debt to try to maintain the standard of living that they had back in January of 2021. And that's a key reason why you know so many Americans, when you poll them, they, they're so disapproving of the economy today and of Joe Biden's handling of the economy. It's because for the vast majority of Americans, they're not better off. They're much worse off. But in terms of those higher income earners, the people who went into this administration already having a high net wealth, right? Let's say they had a lot of assets, whether that's equities, real estate, you name it. You know, those are things that tend to appreciate with inflation. And that's exactly what we've seen. So those people, they've seen their nest eggs grow uh, and other investments uh, have grown equally as, as well. Uh, their incomes tend to rise with inflation too. And so they've done just fine. They also still have pandemic era savings left, uh, even though we are how many years outside of the pandemic right now. So you know they're doing just fine. They've, they've, they have certainly outpaced inflation, both in terms of income and wealth. And so they are responsible now for a disproportionate amount of the growth in things like consumer spending. And so when you have such an, an unequally distributed uh, recovery, leaving aside for a moment the incredible irony about the people who, who constantly talk about a need to redistribute things equally, right? When you have such an unequal economic recovery, uh, you can see headline numbers that look one way when the reality for the vast majority of Americans is something completely different. Indeed, the opposite. Well said. Exactly right. You know, it's a big facade. And I, I like to call it a K-shaped recovery. I you know that's a term that's used quite often. The rich just keep getting richer and the poor keep getting poorer. And it's that middle class that's getting divided and then tending to go flat. So um, very, very concerning times. Um, you know, I wanna start with this debt. Fiscal and monetary policies are certainly not in alignment. The government is spending to no end. Where mm -hmm. We just passed the 34 trillion and you have some excellent tweets. I recommend everyone follow you on Twitter. Very enlightening. Now tell us um, about this debt. You know, people need to know how it's a future burden on the people further monetary debasement, and also fuels inflation. Please tell us more about what's 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 to come and, and, and how it's unsustainable. It, it certainly is. I mean, that, that's really, I think, the, the crowning word for this whole situation. And, and I find it absolutely unbelievable how modern monetary theory essentially was yet again disproven completely wrong for the, the nth time uh, the last several years. And yet now that inflation has come down, suddenly the, the advocates are right back at it saying, oh no, see, everything's fine. We're, we're totally good here. Nothing to worry about, nothing to see here. You know, the 40 year high inflation, that that wasn't a result of spending, borrowing and printing all that money. It had nothing to do with it. Um, I, I, I think the thing that Americans need to realize, two things. Number one, the government doesn't have any money. For the government to spend money, they need to take it from you first. Okay, that's number one. Number two, government spending is always paid for. We throw around this phrase, and I, I'm guilty of doing this too. We throw around this phrase of unfunded government spending or unfunded government expenditures, unfunded government liabilities, whatever. We, we attach the word unfunded to something that the government does. Everything the government does is funded. It's just a question of how is it funded? Is it funded through uh, explicitly taking the money from you through taxes? Is it funded through borrowing it, which means we're going to have to reduce uh, private investment because we're stealing from the loanable funds market? Or are we going to take it through the hidden tax of inflation? 
But one way or another, it is taken from you. It is taken from the private marketplace. A key reason why we have interest rates as high as we do today is the fact that the government is borrowing so much money. That that imposes a cost on you. When you have to uh, pay 8% on a mortgage instead of 7 or 6 or 5 whatever the case may be, you are indirectly paying a higher cost to the government because of their actions, because of their borrowing. Why is that? Because you and the government compete in the loanable funds market. You know, we forget a lot of times the interest rate is just a price. That's all it is, right? It's a price. It's the price to borrow money, borrow money, obviously, over time. So when the government is going to uh, have this, you can look at it as either a huge increase in demand for loanable funds, or you can look at it as, as a reduction in the supply of private loanable funds. Whatever the case, both of those mechanisms however you want to look at it, cause the interest rate for private loanable funds to rise, meaning you're going to pay more. It doesn't matter if it's a mortgage, credit card, auto loan, student loan, anything else and everything in between. So you know, there are all kinds of ways in which government spending impacts us that we don't necessarily think about right away. You know, Obviously, when they say, hey, we're going to raise taxes today, in order to pay for a program that we're funding today. That's a very clear relationship, right? You can clearly see there, okay, one-to-one, -one, no problem. But if you're wondering, where did the government get the trillions upon trillions of dollars that they spent over the last funded years in unfunded liabilities, right? They're taking it out of your hide right now through the hidden tax of inflation. This idea that, that somehow greedy businesses or, or whatever other boogeyman we want to say is causing these higher prices, it's absolute nonsense. If you look at wholesale inflation, which measures the prices that, that businesses are paying compared to the consumer price index, which measures retail inflation or the prices that we're paying, right? The prices paid by businesses have risen faster since January of 2021 than the prices paid by UI and, and all your wonderful listeners. So this idea that that somehow businesses are, are uh, making a killing right now, their profits are up nominally, adjusted for inflation. Their profits have been falling for, I think, the last six or seven quarters. So they are actually making less now in real terms than they did before. The difference is that they are charging more and they themselves are being charged more as well. And they have yet to pass along the, the full freight of all of their cost increases to consumers. In order to maintain market share, a lot of businesses have actually been eating some of those costs. So I, I know I'm I'm sorry, I'm a bit off on, on tangents here in, in terms of Bidenomics, but you know, I, I just think it's very, very important for people to understand there is no free lunch. And that's doubly true whenever we're talking about uh, the government spending any money, even if they're spending money on you directly. Remember that you're paying for the money that they're spending on somebody else. Well said, spoken like a true economist, because as we know in economics, everything is interrelated. There are all these moving parts that just keep moving. And you can't speak about inflation without speaking about debt and the labor market and businesses. Margins are compressed. And we know that. And the mm. higher costs of money, these higher rates haven't even fully worked through the system. So those com those margins are going to be further compressed. And how much longer can they sustain this? We're seeing bankruptcies up significantly. So there's probably much more to come. And I mean, excellent points, EJ. Um, the crowding out of the public sector, you know, and that's what you touched upon. The government always finds a way to pay its debts. But what happens to the people? And you know, we see GDP bloat. And there's it's it's in there, it's the only one that gets revised higher, it seems. Everything else gets revised lower, <laughs> but the GDP gets revised higher because of this massive government spending. And I think if you remove the bloat from that spending, we could see that the private sector is in a recession. What are your thoughts on all that with what's going on with the spending and GDP and the well, recession? Sure. A great question. And you know, it's certainly true. If you remove the debt component uh, and people's ability, whether that's people, you and I, or the government to, to get credit, absolutely we're in a recession. I mean, it, it's looking increasingly like the entirety of growth, the entirety of growth in the fourth quarter was likely fueled by debt. 
you know, going back to the word of the day earlier, unsustainable, I, I'd say that meets the definition right there. You know, obviously the the government in in 105 days, they borrowed a trillion dollars. Uh, so we have that. That clearly is fueling growth on the government side. But for consumers, you know, just the other day, we got credit uh, credit data from the Fed that showed an unexpected jump. We were expecting a small rise, but this was the second biggest increase in revolving debt on record. So revolving debt is is cheaply credit cards, right? As opposed to non-revolving debt, which is I get this loan and then there is an end date and it is not recurring thereafter. So that would be something like uh, I borrow money to buy a car. I'm going to pay 60 payments and then boom, it's done. It's not as if I can take this car you know, back and have it reevaluated and then take a loan uh, at the dealership. So essentially what, what we're finding right now is you combine things like credit card usage, you combine data that shows us that credit cards are getting maxed out. Consumers are increasingly being declined for credit. They're increasingly increasingly being declined uh, for credit limit increases. And now there's this explosion of buy now, pay later, which which has been a thing for a while now, for several years. It's kind of a callback to the, to the 1920s, really, back before we had so many credit cards and so many retailers financed consumers' purchases out of their own retained earnings. It just became too inefficient to do that, though, over the over time. So they just basically allocated that to the credit card companies. But now what's happening? Consumers are running out of credit cards, right? They're running out of, of that line of credit. And so they are increasingly going to retailers who are offering these very generous financing terms, and consumers are taking advantage of it. But here's the problem. What you borrow in Q4 gets paid back in Q1. And so you are going to see that doubly true this time around. And I would not be surprised if we get a particularly low uh, print on the Q1 GDP because of that. Look, all all of this debt on the government end, yes, I understand they, they have a printing press and they can make the charade go on a, a lot longer than the consumer can. But I mean, the average American is just, I think, really hitting a wall right now. They're not going to be able to to keep this up for much longer. That's exactly right. And that's very concerning. Uh, the massive debt that's going on, the consumers just keep packing it on and it's at a much higher rate. And I tend to believe we're higher for longer and higher. You know, in economics, we always talk about the change, the marginal and compared to the ZERP which people are so conditioned for the mm -hmm. recency mm -hmm. bias, we're significantly higher. Yes, historically, we aren't that high, but in real dollars, we are. And the change is significant for people. So I want to quote your recent, um, you have a great article you wrote with Dr. Peter St. Odge. I love your collaboration with him. And you have more than 40% of U.S. personal income taxes in America are consumed just an interest on the federal debt. If the spending mm -hmm. is not cut soon, Argentina style hyperinflation will follow as the only way to pay for excessive government spending. That's scary. Could you please tell us more about that? What could possibly happen with this spending fueling inflation? Oh, sure. You know, eventually you, you get into what, what they sometimes call a debt death spiral, which Sadly, a lot of Americans already find themselves in. And actually, you know, maybe that's a really good way to start because so oftentimes I think federal finance can can kind of seem ethereal and it it's difficult to grasp. But if we think about it just in terms of family finance, that that sometimes helps to clarify. So imagine a family, this this won't take much imagining, sadly, for some people, where uh, the family is spending more than they earn. So they start putting everything on credit cards, everything that they that they can't afford. And what happens? Their credit card balance steadily grows. Well, while the interest rate on those cards are low, the financing charges that are accruing each month aren't that small, or excuse me, aren't, aren't that big. So they can just continue to make those, those minimum monthly payments. They're basically just paying off the interest and they're continuing to rack up credit card debt. But what happens when their credit card debt gets sufficiently large and the interest rates on those cards also rises? Like we've seen today, where now it's at a, a record high. What happens is the financing charges alone exceed what the family can actually put towards those credit cards each month. And so let's say the financing charges are, are $300 on a card. The family can only put uh, $100 towards it. Even if the family doesn't spend anything else on that card, 
you're still going to see the balance grow by $200 month after month. In fact, actually, that's only the first month. Now the balance is bigger, the interest grows, and, and you get that, that exponential growth path there. So you can now never get out of credit card debt. And eventually, because the, the, um, the amount on, the, I should say, the balance on that credit card, the amount you owe continues to grow, the minimum payment is also going to continue to grow because of how those, those formulas are arranged. And as a result, the family is eventually going to have to stop spending on, on necessities, and they're going to have to start spending more and more on that credit card, but they're not actually paying it down. They're just paying to service the debt. And eventually you you get to a point where you literally would have to spend theoretically 100% of your income just to service the debt, and yet it still wouldn't be enough. And, and you would eventually then owe more just in interest than you actually earn. So you're not, you're not spending any money on food, on clothing, on rent, nothing. You are literally just paying to service the debt. Obviously, that's impossible, but that is literally where the United States is heading today. If if you look at interest on the debt, and don't don't bother looking at net interest, which is a category that the Treasury Department puts in in their monthly statement. You know, net interest plays a lot of accounting games to hide the true amount of interest that's being paid on the debt, which is called gross interest. So look at that one. It's already at an annualized rate of a trillion dollars. In other words, it's going to cost a trillion dollars just to service the debt. Again, not pay it down, just to service the debt, just an interest. Wow. And so you've already seen that eclipse defense. Uh, it has eclipsed uh, you know, the, the broader categories of Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera. There are only two line items in the entire monthly report that are larger still. It's the Social Security Administration and the Department of Health and Human Services. So yes, it is bigger than our defense spending all, already. Um, a lot of people think, oh, no, it's not that big yet, again, because they're looking at that net interest component and not the broader gross interest component. Um, but so how, how do we go from there to, to hyperinflation? Well, if that family could counterfeit money in their basement, they would do it. Why? Because the alternative is I don't have any money for food, for housing, for clothing, uh, you know, et cetera. So what's the government going to do? Same thing. They're going to counterfeit. But we just call that quantitative easing because I guess it sounds nicer when, when the Federal Reserve says that instead of, hey, we're counterfeiting money and siphoning off value from every dollar that exists in order to create new ones. That's effectively how the government gets out of that scenario. And, and if there's any doubt as to that happening, you know what? Since we've entered the age of fiat, I can't find a single instance anywhere in the world where a government hasn't decided to take the easy way out on this. So Please explain to me why on earth we should think of ourselves as as any exception to that historical rule. Cool. Well said, exactly right. Very scary um, and a very important. Great point that you look at the gross and um, yeah, we see a trillion in debt expense, um, interest expense. Wow. And they just keep hiding. And, that, and that's the thing. But my question is, you know, and a lot of people wonder how much longer can they keep kicking the can down the road? Mm -hmm. You know, we say unsustainable, but how long do you think they can keep hiding, masquerading, and uh, and continuing this path? That's a really, really good question. Um, I, I I have to criticize a, a lot of my uh, a lot of my colleagues on this, honestly, because I think for so long. People on the right, you know, so-called fiscal conservatives, libertarians, whatever the case may be, have been have been uh, chicken little, right? They've they've been saying the sky is falling here. They have been consistently right about the direction, but not the magnitude. So yes, we are on an unsustainable path, and and we have been for for years, for for a couple of decades now. That's true. But to constantly say if we don't fix this by X magical date. Right or by X magical dollar amount or you know, ratio of, of debt to GDP, uh, you know you, you pick what whatever metric you want to use. You know we have no idea where where that that uh, point of no return is. Let's let's be crystal clear here. So this is not somehow alarmist in the sense of oh my gosh we are one year away from you know from X date. No no it's not that at all. Those those different metrics have proven to be different 
for different countries at different points of time around the world. So we don't know. But that, I think, is the real reason why our current path is so sustainable. We, I mean, who knows? We may already have crossed that point of no return. We don't know. And I think that's why it's so imperative that, that we try to make these moves right now, that we try to turn things around right now. Let's face it. This country is a big old battleship. She takes a very long time to turn around. It's not as if you throw the wheel over and, and it just turns on a dime. So you need to start the process as soon as you can, because we don't know when that process is going to finish and we don't know if it'll be uh, in enough time. You know, so so how long can they keep this thing going? I mean, we, we honestly don't know, because what what has happened every time we face a crisis, they find a new way to kick the can down the road. Look at what happened in March with with the um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, with so many of the regional banks getting into trouble, which honestly, some of them I, I do fault others. I have a lot of sympathy for getting on the wrong side of that interest rate trade because the Fed promised them we're going to continue ZERP for, for years into the future. In other words, that was an implicit um, recommendation. You don't need interest rate hedges. Whereas you have banks like SVB who had a ton of interest rate hedges and only uh, three or four months about before their catastrophic collapse, when those hedges were at the peak of their valuations, they sold them all off. So you, you can make a pretty clear argument that some of these folks knew what they were doing and were counting on getting bailed out, uh, whereas others genuinely were caught with their pants down because the Fed promised one thing and, and then did another. Um, so we're, you know, how, how do we actually turn this thing around? Mm -hmm. I, I think the answer there is just first and foremost, cut the spending. At the end of the day, the spending is what drives everything else. It, it's what drives the machinations at the Fed. It's what causes these, these violent changes in interest rates and asset prices. It's what's causing the debt to rise to catastrophic levels. So many of our, of our economic woes today, whether it's, whether it's the inflation, whether it's the frozen housing market, uh, or you know the, the whole bank term funding program, the whole disaster that has been, all the trouble with the regional banks, you can trace all of that back to excessive government spending. Exactly right. Uh, and that was actually my next question is, what can we do to end this and stop kicking the can down the road? And you answered that. And I just, I guess my question is more of, it seems both sides have taken part in this spending. So do you think it will end? Do you think there's gonna be a fiscal conservative that can come in there and say, hey, this has to stop? Is it possible, do you think? Oh, it's it's certainly possible. Is it likely? I wouldn't bet the rent on it. Um, you know, un unfortunately, the the uniparty is a reality. You know, one one of the things that um, that Trump showed us during his time in office, and this is not an endorsement of Trump. It's yes. not a criticism of Trump. This is just simply reality. Mm -hmm. Under Trump, the establishment Republicans showed the world that they were much more establishment than they were Republican. And you know the the again the uniparty is just a reality that that we have to deal with. Um, you know, can it can an outsider like a Trump or like a Ramaswamy can somebody like that or an RFK even as much as you can call him an outsider? You know, could someone like that really uh, rein in the spending? I, it's certainly possible, absolutely. But but is it likely? I, I I'm not sure. Yeah, we hope for the best, though. Of course, we try mm -hmm. to remain positive. You know, you mentioned some key terms there, QE and the BTFP, the Bank Term Funding Program. I think it's very important we speak about that and we enlighten all the listeners because everyone needs to be aware about how creative the Fed has gotten to inject new liquidity, it seems, into the system as the Fed is offering loans at rates below what it pays to banks who park its money in its vault. So could you please tell us about what's going on since March? I've been seeing a huge rise in this BTFP account. Certainly. So th this goes back to all the problems with, with the regional banks, problems that the Fed itself created. So this is this is once again government having to jump in for a solution to a problem that it caused in the first place. So what, what is the bank term funding program? Essentially what it is, is it allows banks to take devalued assets and get loans using those assets as collateral. So 
for example, the, well, let me let me back up here and say, why is this even necessary? What happened was banks, because interest rates were forced so low by the Fed, credit and money were, were so easily available, it was impossible for banks to, to offer loans at high interest rates because there was somebody else who could undercut them. And so banks were forced to acquire assets at very low interest rates. Now, you may say, why is that an asset? To the bank, it's a revenue stream, right? Every month you're paying your mortgage, that's every month income for the bank. So that's, you know, got to remember, we're thinking about this from the bank's perspective. So they were constantly acquiring all these very low interest rate assets. But then as interest rates rose, what happened? Well, liabilities now had high interest rates. One of the main liabilities is going to be deposits, right? They have to pay you for you to keep your money at the bank. And again, if they don't offer a high enough interest rate on those deposits, what happens? You just go somewhere else, somewhere else who, who has that higher uh, interest rate. And so you have this combination, this deadly combination of low interest rate assets with high interest rate liabilities, and you instantly create negative cash flow. So that, that caused banks like SVB to collapse. What was the Fed's solution? You can take those assets and use them to get a loan. Now, why would the banks not just go to the, the private market and do that in the first place? If a bank has a mortgage at 3%, right? That's their asset. They go to sell that to somebody. Why on earth would I buy that asset, which only pays 3% when I can right now use the money, which I would use to buy that asset. I can just loan that out to somebody else at 5%. The only way you can get me to take that 3% uh, return is if you sell it to me for less than it's actually worth. So that now that extra money, that margin is gonna basically be equal to the value over time of the 2% interest I'm losing by effectively loaning the money at 3% instead of 5%, right? So that's, that's how that mechanism essentially works. So now the problem is all those banks would have to start selling assets at a loss. So you have negative cash flow, and you're gonna exacerbate the problem. And so that again gets into another one of those those downward spirals. So the Fed solution was just take it to us, and we'll value it at par. In other words, we're not going to make you take that haircut. Mm -hmm. Here's the, here's one of the big problems with that though. They are now going to take that money, right, and they're going to loan it out at today's market rates, and it appears like the problem solved, right? except that we're talking about things with, with very long time horizons here, things like a mortgage at 30 years. The bank term funding program offers loans with a maximum term of 12 months, one year. What, what on earth are these banks going to do come March when these loans start mm -hmm. coming due? That's completely unclear. And in fact, when he was asked in a press conference uh, about what is the Fed planning to do here? Are they just simply going to extend those loans? Powell literally said, you can't make this up. Powell literally said, uh, uh, we haven't thought that far ahead. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He literally said, we haven't thought that far ahead. You put one of the biggest band-aids ever on the American financial system, and you hadn't thought more than 12 months ahead. Okay, these are the clowns running our, our central bank. Good to know. So you know now what's what's happening though is... Remember, this is a loan from the Fed, right? You're posting this, this asset as collateral, but you're taking a loan from the Fed. The, the issue is that that has an interest rate attached to it. What else has an interest rate attached to it? Reserves. Because remember, the Fed got rid of the reserve requirement. So the biggest incentive a bank has for keeping reserves at the Fed is that they get interest income on it. Big banks can now take a loan from the Fed at a lower interest rate using the bank term funding program, and then turn right around and deposit that money back at the Fed for a slightly higher interest rate. And you may say, okay, 40 basis points, that's, that's not that big a deal. When you're talking billions of dollars in reserves, I'm sorry, that, that's nothing to sneeze at, right? This is more free money for the banks. But where's the money coming from? that the Fed is using to pay all these banks now on this on this magical arbitrage they've created? Well, remember, anytime the Fed writes a check, it writes it out of an account with a zero balance, a perpetual zero balance. This is how the Fed creates and destroys money. When they write a check, it comes out of an account with no money. So the money is literally created when they write that check. 
And likewise, when they receive money coming in, it goes back into that account with a zero balance. The money's gone. So by, by creating yet another mechanism where they can create money, they are adding more liquidity into the system. It's another example of how they are, you know, the, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing, right? They are they are giving and taking at the exact same time. So we you know, we like to talk about how. Uh, the Fed has been engaging in quantitative tightening, QT, and how they're they're selling off uh, securities. Assets are coming down, you know, meaning the balance sheet is being reduced. But look at things like bank reserves. Bank reserves rose throughout. They they clearly trended upwards throughout all of 2023. I mean, this idea that that we are somehow uh, in tightening financial conditions, nothing could be further from the truth. Well said. Very important that people need to be aware of this. You know, money creation is by lending. You know, people think, oh, the Fed just prints. No, it's through lending that money is minted, about 83%, 85%, something like that. And that spread that you mentioned, uh, I think it's 46 basis points, something around there, um, that's significant on um, billions of dollars. And it just seems to me that these big banks, the JP Morgan, the Wells Fargo, and even Bank of America, we're, we're headed for more con consolidation as there's going to be less banks and more branches. And there's going to be a banking oligopoly that's going on. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. that's very scary. What are your thoughts on that? You think we're going to see more consolidations and the big are just going to get bigger? Well, that's certainly what Janet Yellen wants. And, and she's been very explicit about that. Right. She's talked about, you know, she calls it consolidation as if somehow that, you know, that makes it better. <laughs> it's like calling it quantitative easing. Yeah, we're robbing you with inflation, but we're going to use a fancy way to, uh, uh, to you know, just explain that away right there. You know, you know, she has already talked about how if if we had uh, fewer small banks and more big banks, what would happen? Somehow the financial system would be would be more stable and and secure. Now, does she offer any explanation as as to why she believes that? Of, of course not. You know, but it's certainly what what a lot of her cronies on Wall Street would like to see. Um, you know, and, and to be clear, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not disparaging uh, a lot of the people on Wall Street, very, very fine people. I know many of them at a lot of major banks, whether it's commercial banking or uh, or investment banking, you know, but the fact of the matter is there's a lot of regulatory capture in the financial industry. And, and there's a lot of very dangerous partnerships between Washington and New York. And, and that's a very, very bad thing because it, instead of instead of creating value and instead of enriching themselves by enriching others, right, which is supposed to be the, the basis of capitalism, they have fallen back on this idea that I can enrich myself by impoverishing others. In other words, I don't need to actually create wealth and grow the pie so that my slice gets bigger as everyone else's does, right? I can just take from others. I can grow my slice of the pie by simply taking yours, that's it's something very very dangerous and and it's what Yellen is very very clearly after right now. Very scary again. You know we want competition. You know we want free mm -hmm. markets and that's the best for all. Uh, maybe it's her Keynesian spirits that are telling her that. I don't know, but it's uh, it's very concerning uh, when we see that. You know I want to go into the labor market. You had an excellent tweet. I urge everyone to read your thread as you dissected that number, the unemployment number, as well as the household versus establishment survey disparities. And I actually noticed that myself back in 22, I was seeing that huge disparity as well right, when I was right. analyzing the data. So the multiple job holders being counted more than once, and that's very concerning as well. So According to your tweet, I'm going to quote you, we don't have 6.3 million unemployed with 3.7 unemployment. Rather, we have between 11.1 to 13.1 million unemployed with 6.4 to 7.5 unemployment. Now, that's a huge difference. Of course, we know government jobs were added as well as multiple job holders being counted multiple time, but that's a big disparity. Please tell us, EJ, what's going on and, and why this huge disparity? Is it something to do with the labor force participation rate? 
Certainly, absolutely. <laughs> you know, and 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 you're right. You know, going back to something you said earlier. First, something clearly breaks in the labor market in 22, specifically March of 22. We we see a bunch of of uh, you know. When, when you chart these things, they're very clearly inflection points, right? There are kinks in the line that, that happen at that point. And it's across a whole host of different metrics at, at BLS, oddly enough. Um, but one of which is the difference between the employment, uh, excuse me, the difference between the, the household survey and the establishment survey. So the household survey, as its name implies, is a survey of households. Establishment survey is a, a survey of businesses. So we get things like the unemployment rate from the household survey, we get the top line jobs number from the establishment survey, what is really called non-farm payrolls. And you're absolutely right that when you have multiple job holders, in other words, I go out and I get a second job, or if I already have two, I go out and get even a third job, what happens? The number of people employed, according to the household survey, that doesn't rise. But the number of jobs, according to the establishment survey, does. And so as we've seen more and more Americans have to go and get that second or even third job, we have seen this huge increase in the number of uh, non-farm payrolls, again, which we oftentimes think of as people employed, but it's not. But the actual number of people employed has not kept up. And, and the way these two have, have diverged over time is actually unprecedented. We genuinely have never seen anything like this as long as, as BLS has been keeping track of this data. Um, one of the uh, one of the other things with with the household survey, obviously, since it has the unemployment rate, it also needs to have the the labor force participation rate component to it, and that ha still has not recovered to pre pandemic levels. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have uh, the people who are in the labor force, you have that lower participation rate, right? But on top of that, you also have a huge number of people who aren't even included in the labor force uh, calculation at all. There, in fact, BLS literally publishes a statistic called not in the labor force. And it's up over 5 million compared to pre-pandemic. It's up even more than that compared to the pre-pandemic trend. And so what, what you can clearly see, because we have to remember things like the unemployment rate, the labor force participation rate, these are rates. That means they're a fraction. You can change the numerator or the denominator and the output will change, right? So we have to remember that as you remove literally millions of people from these equations, that's having an impact on things like the unemployment rate. And as soon as you account for those changes, as you as soon as you look and you say, okay, we have all these millions of people who, who left in COVID and still haven't come back. You have number of people on disability up by, again, millions. Let's see what happens if we actually put those people back in to the calculation. And sure enough, you end up with an employment rate, you know, in, in the 6%, in the 7% range. Now, that's not catastrophic, right? We had higher rates uh, in, in the Great Recession, for example. We had obviously much higher rates uh, in, you know, in things like um, the, the 1981, 80, 81 recession. So it's not to say that that's catastrophic, but it is firmly in recession territory, and it's certainly much higher than the the three point seven percent that that we're being told exists in the economy today. You know, it's it's very much like how in World War II, as soon as that conflict started, what happened? You took millions of of young men, most of whom were unemployed, out of the labor force and into uniform. That did wonders for the unemployment rate. It took it from double digits to virtually zero. And it did it overnight. We're seeing a similar phenomenon now, just at a you know smaller scale. Wow! Thank you so much for bringing us the truth in that and uh, taking apart that BLS report with the non-farm payroll and unemployment. The reality you bring the reality, EJ, and it's so important. So okay. So to me, inflation is much higher than they seem to report as well. I also think it's also a higher number. You look at trueflation and they're like, since 2020, you know, and they say it's in the 20s when you compound it. And it's very mm -hmm. important in compounding the inflation. We all know that we have higher prices. Everything's higher. There are new fees out there. Okay, so we have higher inflation. There's no uh, deflation like they keep talking about. They keep thinking we're going to, they keep saying we're going to go back to 2%. And then now we see unemployment is much higher. Welcome to the gig economy, I call it, um, where mm. everyone has a gig going on and labor yes. participation rate is lower than pre-pandemic. 
What are your thoughts, EJ, on a Fed pivot? The market seems to have expectations of five to seven cuts this year on rates. Do mm -hmm. you believe mm -hmm. we're going to have higher for longer? Do you think the market's wrong? What are your thoughts on what the Fed will be doing this year with all this data that you see, the reality of what you see? Well, un unfortunately, I, I see a big difference between what I think they'll do and, and what they should do. Um, I, I did not think that was the case up until just you know a, a month ago, but now all of a sudden, you know, Powell has has been pretty explicit about about their intentions to uh, to end quantitative tightening and to move away from the uh, the higher for longer and, and into rate cuts. You know, in a lot of ways, I I uh, I'm I guess I'm beating myself up over it a little bit, thinking, wow, how could you have been so naive? You know, Powell is the same guy. Let's not forget, as I did. Powell is the same guy who, when he was up for renomination, he kept rates under 1% as inflation ran up to a 40-year high. And when asked about a, a 75 basis point hike instead of just a you know, uh, 50 basis or half a percent, he said, no, 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 a 75 basis point hike is off the table. What did he do as soon as he was uh, confirmed by the Senate for his second term? Gave us four of those 75 basis point hikes in a row. So, you know, what was there? And I, I think a lot of that was intentional on the White House's part. You know, if if they had not delayed Powell's renomination so long, Powell could have moved much quicker than he actually did. But because he he had that political constraint, that albatross around his neck, he was stuck. He had to keep rates low in order to keep the White House appeased. And you know, Donald Trump has made it very clear. If he uh, is reelected, he's getting rid of Powell, full stop. He has more than once said that Powell is his, his worst appointment ever. I don't know if that's true. It, he's certainly in the running. You know, <laughs> Trump had plenty of bad appointments. It's amazing. <laughs> the man had some fabulous appointments and then some absolutely terrible ones um, and, and very little in between. But Powell, I think, knows that if Trump wins in November, he's toast. You know, he, he may get a lot of really great speaking gigs on Wall Street thereafter, but in, in terms of his career at the Fed and, and in any other government appointments, he's probably done for life. If Biden wins, there's a good chance Powell gets a third term. Um, so what is Powell's incentive? Powell's incentive is now to keep economic conditions A-OK -okay until the first Tuesday of November. After that, who the hell cares? But up until that point, he needs to keep the whole thing to get, you know, stitched together with bubble gum and bailing wire as best he can. Um, I think that's probably what he's going to try to do. He is going to create as much money as he can politically get away with next year, or I should say this year, excuse me, yeah. this year, 2024. Um, you know, it's, it, I, I wish I did not have to be this cynical. Um, I, I used to think that the Fed was a, was a nonpartisan institution, that they were data dependent. But how many times have we seen inflation expectations, which Powell swears by that, you know, this is a metric they watch so, so closely. We have seen time and time again where inflation expectations jumped and the Fed did not. They just said, ah, oh, it's probably nothing. Likewise, we've seen times when inflation expectations actually came down. And then the Fed said, you know what, this would be a good time for a quarter basis point hike. So, I mean, this idea that that they look at the numbers, the only numbers they look at, frankly, are the polls. And, and it's not even the polls of themselves. It's the polls of their political masters. Uh, again, I, I wish that weren't the case. I wish we could expect higher for longer from the Fed. But I, I just don't see that happening. And, and even if they do keep rates where they are, uh, even if they they do maintain the the quantitative tightening, right, which is the the sale of of securities, I think they will find other ways to inject liquidity. They will find other ways to grow the balance sheet, right? Such as such as emergency loans. That is going to cause the the assets on on the Fed's books to increase without actually increasing the the volume of securities they hold. Um, let's not forget the you know reverse repo market is still going to inject about a trillion dollars of liquidity this year before that runs dry. So they, they I think, are unfortunately going to find as many ways as they can to inject as much cash as they can into this market. Because let's not forget, 
when it comes to that money creation, the good effects come first, the bad effects come later. You know, Milton Friedman famously um, uh, mm -hmm. used, used alcoholism as the metaphor there. You feel good at first, the hangover comes tomorrow. That, that's the only reason anybody drinks too much. If you had to go through the hangover first, nobody would have more than one or two drinks. Well said. You know, that's why we're so blessed to have you, EJ, um, to speak the truth. And I love that. You know, you speak what you see and how it is. And I appreciate that very much. And I agree completely with you. Otherwise, I'd be wrong if I didn't, because <laughs> I, I do. Um, you know, it, it's um, I love that you quote Milton Friedman. And actually, over the holidays, I watched with our kids Free to Choose. It's a great TV mm, series, mm -hmm, like 10, mm -hmm. I think it's 10 episodes. Love that. And Milton Friedman is fantastic. And the monetarist. Um, I love and I love that quote by him. Um, and he talked about in that episode about the the airbags. That was a big thing in the early 80s. Um, but yes. there love, love his stuff and his work. You know, I think the Fed has lost credibility at this point. And, you know, they they seem to be absolutely politically affiliated. And, you know, it's an election year. And I always wonder, do they know something? You know, they're hiding all this data, but, you know, they're smart people. They must know something's going on under the hood. So maybe that's why they're also in this pivot camp and they're going to be cutting rates. Um, who knows what's in their minds? But, you know, they're they're competent people, very smart. Um, so um, I think that's um, we know that they're injecting liquidity. And we can tell by looking at the financial markets. And that's what I want to ask you about, the stock market. You know, many people are talking about we're in a new bull market and the market has just been strong and running. A lot of mm -hmm. economists have been talking about a 1970s replay plus higher debt. But when we look at the financial market, we see a different picture and we see this mass liquidity and, you know, at the same time, we have extended multiples, like we discussed, margins compressed, higher cost of money still hasn't worked through the system. And um, consumers are strapped. Buy now, pay later. Excellent point that you mentioned earlier. Higher debt. Um, but then we know that it's really the, the top, you know, one to 5% that really invests in the stock market. And like we discussed, the K-shaped recovery, the rich getting richer, what are your thoughts on the financial markets and into this year? Do you think there's going to be a reality check or do you think it's looks like the liquidity is, is going towards the markets? It's a really, really good question. Um, equities are an interesting one, largely because of, of reverse repos. I mean, uh, essentially what's happening today is people are, I should say banks, are, are increasingly choosing instead of lending to the Fed to lend to the Treasury. Um, now, you may say, OK, that seems like a pretty clear one to one transition there. No harm, no foul. Why would that change anything? Because when you're lending to the Fed, that money's locked up. When you lend to the Treasury, it gets spent. It gets spent right away. Mm -hmm. So that means that it's going to work its way through the banking system and it's going to multiply. And that's where you get most of that inflationary impact. I, I think you mentioned earlier, actually, right, when the Fed creates money for the government to spend, you know, you, let's use the old 10 to 1 ratio just to make it simple for, for reserves. The Fed creates a dollar for the, the Treasury to spend. However, that then works its way through the banking system and multiplies and creates nine additional dollars. So mm -hmm. the, what the Fed did with reverse repos under Biden was to essentially create a system where we can um, print this money for the government to spend, but then sterilize it in reverse repos. You know, in order to maintain our, our interest rate floor. And we now eliminate 90% of the inflationary impact from our money creation. So you know, one of the key things now that's helping to continue fuel inflation, despite the fact that the Fed has been selling securities, is the fact that as money moves out of reverse repos and goes to lending to the treasury because of their you know, multi-trillion dollar borrowing spree, what's happening? You're basically taking two, $2 trillion out of sterilization. You're letting it out to play where it's going to create another, uh, uh, what's that, uh, $18 trillion, right? So this idea that that somehow um, this, this swap in trading, or I should say this swap in lending, isn't going to have an impact, I think, is deeply, deeply flawed. And sure enough, as money has left reverse repos, it has caused bank reserves to increase. 
And if you um, if you take uh, a chart of the S and P and bank reserves and you overlay them, you can see there's a very very tight correlation there, even without actually doing any math to to establish it. Just visually, you can see it. And so as long as we continue to have that reverse repo drain, you're continuing to have that liquidity injection, and that's going to continue to buoy equities. Now, what happens when that runs out? You know, now the Fed has to find some other way to inject liquidity if we're going to have equities continue to rise. If not, the game's over, and we, you know, the music stops, and we get to see who's left without a seat. But it remains to be seen whether or not the Fed is going to find a new way, again, to inject that liquidity. Because otherwise, we go back to something we said at the very beginning of this conversation, crowding out. As long as Yellen continues to suck all the oxygen out of the room with her borrowing spree, you're, you're going to continue to have these problems. Well said. Exactly right, EJ. Now, I want to get your thoughts on different asset classes. Um, mm -hmm. Is there commodities, the real assets during this time period, tech, the cash generators, the MAG7, the highly liquid ones? Is there anything you're bullish on or, or that you're interested in or maybe more bearish on instead? Um, and your thoughts on Bitcoin? Oh, sure. Well, let, let, let's take Bitcoin first, I guess. Um, so I... I I have no horse in this race. I don't own any Bitcoin. I am I'm neither short nor long, right? Um, but but I, I still like it. I like the idea of it. I like the fact uh, that this is a workaround to legal tender laws, which are unconstitutional and a fundamental violation of human rights. And that's not an exaggeration, right? It, 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 is, it is literally a, a violation of people's rights to tell them, if you do not transact in this fraudulent medium, you will go to jail. But that's what it means when you look at a dollar bill and it says on it, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. That's effectively what that means. So you know, for all, for all of those reasons, I, I really like Bitcoin. Uh, it, is it a panacea? I don't think so. One of the key problems that I have with it is the fact that its supply is ultimately limited. Now you may say that, but that's beautiful. That mm -hmm. means you can't inflate it. That's true, but it also means eventually you will have destructive deflation because mm -hmm. at some point you will reach that limit where no more Bitcoin can be created, but the, the economy, whether it's the US economy or the global economy will continue to grow. And, and at that point, you, you do get into some very destructive economic effects because of that. Um, that's not to say all deflation everywhere is always bad. It's not. But you do want a money supply that can grow with the broader economy. And, and for that reason, I, I'm i sorry, but I, I still, if I had to pick one or the other right now, I would still pick gold over Bitcoin. Again, I still really like Bitcoin. I, I will not, I will not, you know, be a, become a critic of it or anything like that. Um, and we are far, far away from pegging the dollar to anything, whether it's gold, Bitcoin, or or something else, you name it. Um, but but at the end of the day, those are those are just, I guess, my my thoughts on on Bitcoin itself. Um, again, by no means opposed to it, and you will mm -hmm. not hear me uh, you will not hear me criticize it or ever try to forbid anyone from from transacting in it. Uh, what what are we looking at in terms of of, of asset classes in in twenty twenty four? I see a tremendous amount of parallels between today and the 1970s, particularly late 70s, early 80s. And I think the Fed risks this year repeating the mistakes that they made uh, in the late 1970s and setting off another inflationary storm in, in 2025 and beyond. Again, something we we mentioned earlier. So what, what do I like? You know, the same types of things that did well then have a good chance of doing well now because the conditions are so similar. Um, things like selective real estate trust. Now you want to be careful here, obviously. Don't trust, you know, don't touch commercial real estate with a 39 and a half foot pole. Um, <laughs> same thing with, with the regional banks. Those things are very, very closely tied together. Um, but selective REITs, I think, can be very, very good investments, particularly uh, when you stay away from, from those um from those metro areas that have already seen just a ridiculous amount of unsustainable growth, looking at you, Miami, um, you know that that's I think a very good example where the odds of, of houses losing value there 
is actually getting getting very, very high. It's getting kind of scary because you increasingly have people who can't afford things like homeowners insurance. And, and you're now running into problems where you have areas that require you to have that insurance. And yet you literally can't find an underwriter who even wants to write that business. That's problematic. Some of that's because of um, conditions within the insurance market, but it's also because the, the price of the home and the cost of replacement has just gone to stratospheric levels. And so you, you now have a lot of people who literally, if they had to do it today, couldn't afford to buy their own homes. This is problematic. So, so selective REITs, I, I, but I still really like as long as you can can get the markets that that have uh, have more value today and are not overpriced. Uh, commodities, I think, are going to do very well. Gold, I'm I'm very bullish on. Um, in fact, if if I had to choose, uh, I was just talking to a money manager actually a, a couple of weeks ago, and we both agreed if we had to choose between either gold or equities broadly for 2024, we would both pick gold. So. Mm -hmm. Commodities I like. Uh, utilities I think are actually going to be very safe. Um, you have the ability there to 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 pass on a lot of costs to to consumers as your own costs rise. Um, uh, you know, uh, again, go back and look at the kinds of things that did well, including a lot of counter cyclicals in the late '70s and early '80s. And I think you'll find a lot of diamonds in the rough today in terms of of where to trust your money. Uh, don't I wouldn't touch a government bond if if my life depended on it. By the way, <laughs> thank you so much for those wise words and and valuable insight. Um, and I appreciate that very much, EJ. So I want to just get an overview. We're going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for your time today. My um, pleasure. What are your thoughts on the economy and the markets into 2024? I know you touched upon it. it's an election year. Um, so let's go out to 2025. Now, this much talked about recession. Everyone's like, there has to be a recession. And, you know, of course, some say soft landing, some saying hard landing, no landing. Do you think that it's pushed out further and eventually we're going to have to pay the piper and there's going to be some type of hard landing into maybe next year or maybe further out? You know, the, the Fed was created in December of 1913, and ever since then, it has always created hard landings. Now, mm -hmm. has it been able to delay them for a while? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, again, look at the 70s, right? How many times did they kick that can down the road? And so when it looked like we were coming in for that hard landing, they hit the throttle again, and it became a no landing. Of, of course, then you're right back on that inflation roller coaster. But so to, to your point, it, it's a lot like cancer. When you catch it early, stage one, it takes a minimal amount of, of chemotherapy and radiation. You're not going to really do a lot of harm to the rest of the organism, right? The patient is not going to have to go through hell to kill this cancer. But when, when you instead put the patient on a sugar diet, what happens? That tumor grows mm -hmm. and it grows fast and you don't give it the chemo and the radiation it needs. So now when it hits stage four, now you end up having to nuke the sucker and you do a ton of harm to the patient in the process. So the longer the Fed does kick that can down the road, the more Band-Aids they put on the system, instead of ripping the Band-Aid off, the worse the eventual recession becomes. And that's a key reason why that 80-81 recession was one for the record books. You know, why was the, the Great Recession so bad and why was it so long? Again, the Fed kept rates way too low for way too long. And then what was their answer after they put rates up and the recession began? Drop the rates all the way back to zero again and, and start this policy of ZERP. And, and as a result, you never had the um, you never had the reallocation of capital that usually happens in a recession because the recession was actually cut short. And so you did return to economic growth, but it was anemic, it was pathetic, right? You have one or 2% growth per year that doesn't even keep up with, with population growth. Th that's not a recipe for wealth, that's a recipe for impoverishment. So what do we have you know, lo looking forward here? Like you said, beyond 24 into, into 25 and, and thereafter. I think a lot of that is going to depend on, um, I should say, I'll, that situation improving 
depends on changes in leadership. Um, this is not an endorsement, but I absolutely love how Ramaswamy keeps hammering the idea that if we have a Fed at all, it should be focused on one thing and one thing only, and that's price stability. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had dinner with him up, up in New York a um, couple, couple months ago, two, two or three months ago, we'll say. And uh, I, I had said to him, you know, Mr. Ramaswamy, I, frankly, I, I'm not even sure that goes far enough. I think even if you have a Fed, there's so many different ways they have of manipulating the market. I think you need to put a, you know, X, Y, and Z um, conditions and restraints in there. Basically, I'm telling him we need to put a choke collar on the Fed. And uh, he turned to me and he goes, I love that. I love <laughs> that my proposal is not enough for you. He said, I don't want people who, when I propose the bare minimum we need, fight me. He said, I want people who, when I propose the bare minimum, say, let's go one step further. And I I, I was, I found that very, very appealing, that mentality. Um, because I, I do think uh, he and others like him, again, this is not an endorsement of him, mm -hmm. but I, I do think he and others like him understand that we do really need to chain the beast here. And it's going to take a pretty radical change in leadership at the Fed, at the Treasury, throughout government to really make the changes we need, uh, again, to course correct here, to get us back on a track to something that even resembles fiscal sanity and, and long long term stability. Now, we've been in worse shape before, right? I mean, we had a civil war for crying out loud. We we got rid of the gold standard plenty of times before, and we were able to get back on. The Fed is not our first central bank; it's our fourth. We buried the first three. We can bury this one too. I mean, the the idea, you know, again, going back to to how I have to critique some of my colleagues who have been chicken little saying the sky is falling. The idea that that we have never been through worse and that the end is nigh. You know what? We have been through worse and, and hopefully we have enough time before the end to, to get this country back to a greater place where it was before and you know where it can be again. Wow. Well, it's people like you that are enlightening and waking people up to know there's hope but we need to change course. I like that chokehold on the Fed, absolutely. You know, the Fed give us whiplash. You know, they went so to yes. zero, then they went up so fast. I think over 500 basis points in a little over a year. So um, that has ramifications and there are consequences. And I, I believe Murray Rothbard, I read one of his books, or a couple of his books recently. They're all free on the Mises Institute site for mm -hmm. everyone who wants to read them. And I love Mises Institute, my one of my favorite websites. Um, and, you know, he talks about, you know, you just have to work through. It's going to be pain, but you have to work through it. You can't keep putting these Band-Aids on and keep kicking the can down the road. But I say Dr. E.J. Anthony for Fed Chair, right? I think you would do an excellent job. I, I do not wish that on my worst <laughs> enemy, please. I know, right? But thank you so much for everything. Now, I want to know, what are you working on these days? And what can we look forward to hearing from you? Anything coming up? And how can people follow you and read all your fantastic work? Well, the best place to follow me is going to be on X. Uh, that's that's really the only social media that that I use. Um, I, I find it's a, a very very good platform for for getting across the kind of information that that I try to provide for for the American people and really uh, around the world. I'm actually genuinely surprised at how many uh, international followers I have. So that's the best place to find me. The handle there is is at real EJ Antoni. Uh, I post all kinds of, of uh, reviews of data releases there so that you don't need to be an expert to, to actually do these deep dives. You can you can get the, the summaries from me, which I promise will be an, an honest critique and not just the headlines you read in the news. Uh, I post the articles that I write uh, and, and also other thoughts as well uh, in terms of what, what you can look forward. That will all continue. But early this year, we'll, we'll also be publishing a, a paper, a definitive paper, uh, for the Heritage Foundation, which will essentially be our stance on monetary policy. So how and and also how we go from from where we are today to that um, you know that that shining uh, shining star or that north star I should say um, how we get from from here to there. So not just this is what we uh, what we support, but also here's our roadmap for getting there. So you you can look forward to that in the coming months. 
Wonderful. Love that. Looking forward to the future and how we can get to where we want to be. Um, definitely looking forward to that um, publication. Thank you so much for meeting with us and speaking about the truth in economics, EJ. You are amazing. You're awesome. And fantastic. This has been great. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. Thank you.